All right, very good. Um, our plan for today uh, is to talk a little bit about new librarianship overall, some introductory comments and what's in it. Um, Bruno will be hopefully moderating. I think right now he's having a little audio problems, but uh, he'll hopefully be joining us and watching questions. Uh, we'll go to about 10.40, 10.45. I'm sorry, your time. 3.40, 3.45. Time zones mess me up. Um, and then hopefully we'll have plenty of time for conversations and questions. My name is David Lankus. I am director of the School of Library and Information Science here at the University of South Carolina and a professor. Uh, and have been working for many, many years around the idea of librarianship. What is librarianship? How do we define it? Um, how is it evolving? And obviously how it relates to libraries as institutions and organizations. So with that, I want to talk um, a little bit once again about the broad context that we're in. And then as we have uh, time to take questions and jump right into specifics. So. Um, I just recently returned from a trip over in Europe. I was in the Netherlands and I was in Norway. Um, and while there, just visited some amazing and fabulous libraries um, and heard uh, a lot about really a European library renaissance that if you look around right now in the Netherlands, in Norway, in Finland, in you, lots of different places, you're seeing the construction of some rather amazing new central libraries, uh, cathedrals of the people, if you will. And it, it's an interesting thing to watch, right? So I was in um, two of the ones that, that have been getting a lot of attention um, is the uh, DOC1 in Aarhus in Denmark. Uh, they also host the NEXT conference. And it's an amazing building that has turned into an amazing system. Um, it really looks at ways of building the community. It looks at um, not only a wonderful space, but wonderful programming, connecting in, working with all sorts of organizations around the city, the country, and the world, really. Um, in the Netherlands, there's Lokal uh, in Tilburg that opened up, I believe, just about two or three years ago. Um, and what was amazing was to watch that process. Um, it was built in a former train maintenance factory um, and huge areas where they would bring in trains to work on engines, et cetera. And when that industry had faded and much of that work had moved elsewhere, they were really looking at what to do with that space. They looked at the idea of putting a public library in that space. What I love about that process is rather than simply start going and building and constructing and putting up stacks or putting up tables or what have you, they began a really several year long process of thinking about what should a central library look like. They created spaces that were co-located with startups. They created event spaces to pe have people come in and speak. And they invented pop-up libraries where they could quickly try new ideas, whether it was physical layouts, whether it was programming, what have you. And so it was a whole set of years of experimentation that led finally into the final design that was built that is described as the living room of the city. Um, and it's a pretty amazing building and a pretty amazing structure. Um, excuse me one second. Uh, there we go. So you see the Helsinki, you see Finland, Utrecht is building a new public library. Um, and all of them are trying new things. The one I was lucky enough to get an early peek at um, was the new central library in Oslo, Norway. Um, it is an architectural miracle, as far as I'm concerned. It's a beautiful place, huge in space. Um, and that also came from a lot of thinking about what the community needed. One trend that's going on in public libraries, both here in the States and in many places I see, including in Europe, is they actually begin by redoing all the branches, public libraries, and then come in and do the, the central library last, which I think is a, a nice way of doing it. But when talking to the folks working on the new central library and talking about what they want, talking about spaces, talking about collaboration areas, talking about maker spaces, technology, community fora, the whole thing, one very interesting fact popped out. And that was, the, that, was that from moving from the old central library to the new central library, only 50% of the collection was coming over. The rest of that collection was going to the national library to be distributed where necessary. Now, that's not in, in itself 
unusual. Many central libraries and new public libraries are built and they do a pretty significant amount of weeding, not only to reduce the burden of moving things, but to create space for new collections and new materials. What I found remarkable was that's not the plan. The plan is to have a collection that is 50% the size of what it was in the old building going forward. Um, and in discussing why that was, um, it came into things like, sure, there's an expectation of greater digital availability, right? A lot of, you know, you see this in academic libraries, public libraries, school libraries, libraries of all sorts, where whole areas that were brought up around reference resources, quick reference materials, et cetera, sort of disappeared. You got them originally on CD-ROM, and these days you get them through the internet, and so we don't need the physical materials because not only the physical materials taking up a lot of space, but they go out of date and there's no real easy way to update them. We see this in a lot of different places, but this became as a conversation about what the central library's function is. It is no longer being envisioned as the library of last resort, the place that held all the materials and then would send them out if necessary. It was seen as an active connection into downtown life, into city life, and quite frankly, a representation of the aspirations of that community. So we're seeing this library boom. We're seeing a lot of new libraries being built. These are, these are public libraries, but in the academic library sector, we also see huge libraries. I just came back from Taipei, and it was in Taiwan, and they have a brand new academic library that is built around collaboration, study space, beautiful architecture. We see this notion of really creating new um, spaces, creating new connections. Um, one of the things that this is a result of, um, when I was in Oslo, I was uh, heard about a wonderful project, Alnpub, um, headed by Ragnar Christensen, um, which looked at as particularly Euro the European Union countries are pushing for digital first, pushing for a whole suite of digital services, whether it's voting or electronic payments or citizenship activities or getting on a tram or anything, but there's a huge push for going online. What this study found, and it was through the Scandinavian countries, it was in Germany and it was in Hungary, was that matching this push for digital service was a match for and use of physical uh, public sphere services such as libraries, archives, and museums. A lot of potential reasons such as they needed support to go digital or they were looking for a human connection in this digital first world. And so I don't see this trend slowing down at all. The question becomes, as these libraries are talking about what's driving them for change, right? They're talking about Collaboration. Libraries are a place to collaborate, whether that's done around the language of third space, living room, um, community hub, what have you. There is a place that people need to come to work together. Um, most libraries now have rooms that you can check out to work with two, four, seven individuals or larger rooms to work with larger groups. There's a strong push for community. And I want to take a moment here because in new librarianship, in the librarianship that, that we're talking about, community is central. And many people take the word community, particularly given the previous slide, and automatically think I'm talking about public libraries, that our community is a city, a town, what have you. But a community is, is a broader concept. And so just to get the language up front, what is a community? A community is a common, a group around a common variable, where they live, where they work, where they study, interests they may have, um, all sorts of things, where they heal. Um, and they also have to share scarce resources. There's a system of how do you allocate resources. For example, land. Where do we give this patch of land for a new library or does it need to go for public green space, what have you? Money, resources, attention, time. All of these things. And so a community is really that idea of a common narrative where people around a common variable figure out how to allocate resources to where they want to be. So that can be a city or a town, but it can also be a university or a hospital, um, all sorts of things, right? And this shift of looking at community versus talking about institutions or municipalities is also part of a shift in librarianship to get out of the idea that 
academic libraries, public libraries, school libraries, special libraries are somehow these silos that don't interact and discuss together. A lot of new librarianship, as we'll talk about, is a framework of cutting across all types of libraries because the focus is on the professional, the librarians. Other drivers of change. These libraries, these institutions, are seen learning as central to what they are doing. Once again, in an academic setting, we see a huge um, influx where most librarians being hired these days are instructional librarians. Librarians that work with students and faculty and staff and work on developing instruction, not simply about how to use the library, but in how to do things like understand fake news, understanding digital skills, understanding study skills. And certainly, this is true in public settings as well. We see this moving, you know, as, as libraries have moved from these are our hours for collections and reference to these are the workshops that we offer. These are the different experts we're going to bring in. These are the speaker series. So a lot of librarianship becomes around, um, comes around learning. New, and I say new within maybe the last decade, has been a shift of looking at libraries, public and others, um, as drivers of democratic participation. A lot of the language that we used to talk about as the role or purpose of a library was originally around literacy. This was a place for people to come get books and materials. This was a place to enrich reading, to create a love of reading. This was a place of filling digital skills, what have you. So the goal was around literacy, traditional reading, writing literacy, information literacy, media literacy, network literacy. But that began shifting from literacy, which was a skill set, to the notion of community. What did a community need? Maybe it was literacy. Maybe it was simply a place to be together. Maybe it was a common narrative. And that has shifted now to talking about uh, libraries as necessary, or in Eric Kleinberg's language, vital social infrastructure to support democratic participation. And this is one of the things I found out on my last trip, which is just blows my mind, um, is that things like uh, the library legislation in both Norway and Finland build this democratic mission in specifically to library authorization. That is, that libraries have a role in gathering people and bringing them together and talking about the state of the country, the state of democracy, talk about different issues. Um, and so that's a big driver. And once again, as I mentioned before with the OMPUB, this push for digital first, right? That, that doesn't just mean libraries need less room because they're more digital collections, but it means they need an increasing amount to support. In Sweden, where they went to digital first, they actually created funding and worked with the network of public libraries around the country to develop digital literacy training for the librarians because they knew that librarians and libraries were going to be one of the major support systems. As the country drove more and more into working online, they knew they needed to bring people up to speed, and they looked at libraries as a crucial place to do that. Um, the line that, that I often use is, if you're going to have smart cities or smart countries, you need smart citizens. And so that means training and making them available. So once again, some absolutely fabulous uh, data from that report if you want to take a look at it. But that's what we're giving you a little bit of context. What is new librarianship when we mention it? Um, sometimes it's simply called community librarianship, though um, in the Netherlands you call it community librarianship, but if you talk about community librarianship in the UK and Britain, that's bad because it usually means that they're getting rid of professional librarians and housing them with volunteers. That is not where we're going with this. But what is it? Um, it's a high-level framework to navigate uh, the present and future beyond looking at libraries and the work of librarians as functions, media, and space. Um, the, the picture here is of the Atlas of New Librarianship. Uh, this is where I really sort of crystallized this as a book, trying to bring in all these great ideas from brilliant libraries and community planners and instructional folks into one place to make sense of this. Um, but a lot of how we used to, and many of us still do, look at librarianship, it's the idea that you usually have a space of some sort. It has materials, and we loan out those materials to the public, and then we build a series of services to make that process efficient, whether it's 
reference to answer questions or cataloging to put order to things. Um, the idea that when I, as a library science professor, prepare librarians, I teach them how to do cataloging and information seeking and reference and resources and materials. This is an idea of moving it back to the notion of first, what is a librarian and defining the role and function of libraries as institutions by librarians as professionals. And secondly, centering it on the concept of knowledge. Many of us will talk about knowledge as uh, something that libraries have always done, but really new librarianship pushes hard on that idea that a book is not knowledge, that your shelves are not full of knowledge. Knowledge is a sort of uniquely human process and it's unique to each human. So when you write something down, when you put it on the shelf, that's not knowledge, it's the result of knowledge. And it may help build other people's knowledge, readers, but it's not knowledge in and of itself. A quick, really easy way of, of understanding the difference is, if I give you a book written in a language that you do not speak, can we truly call that book knowledge to me? Because I can't truly understand it. Also, what is knowledge is, many people might look at that book that I can't read, but still appreciate it. it's a beautiful book, I love the binding, look at the images, etc. I may learn a lot from something that I can't read the text of, but it wasn't what the intention of the original authors were. So we can't say that that book is knowledge, and we're sort of moving it around as a unit, because it's just a tool to help people become knowledgeable. So knowledge is created through conversation. And we're going to go into this in a bit more detail. Uh, but it comes out on the idea of whether it's one to many, whether it's one to one, but oftentimes it's within the individual. You know, when you talk to yourself. Now we call that critical thinking or reflective thinking or what have you, but this idea that we're constantly in dialogue using language back and forth with folks to try and make meaning of our life, try to gain power so that we can have a better situation in life. And that power can be reading, that power can be knowing about a lot of things or very important things, or that power can be political power, all different kinds of power. So if librarians are in the knowledge business, then librarians are in the conversation business. New librarianship is an approach of what librarians' role is in that setting, right? It, when we move away from, you know, if, when, people thought, oh, the book, that's knowledge, then we were in the knowledge business that meant caretaking the books, cataloging, shelving them, preserving them, taking care of them. But as we've come to understand, knowledge is, once again, this uniquely human process. The role of librarian isn't so much to maintain the tools, that's partly, but to truly facilitate people learning people talking to people, people understanding new things. And so a new core function of librarianship is facilitation. So a little bit more. New librarianship puts the community and the individual at the center of librarianship. That means rather than saying it's the books and whether the collection is complete and how many volumes we have and what's the architecture and space, we begin by saying, what is the community treat seeking to learn? How does it function? How do we learn and know these kinds of things? And so new librarianship is about the individual. And once again, the center focus on um, librarianship. It began by uh, a really interesting question. Fellow, uh, former dean of the Drexel School here in the United States, David Fenske, said, you know, we won't push the field forward until we can understand what a librarian is without a reference to the building. In other words, is a librarian someone who works in a library, or is a librarian someone that has these skills, these functions, these philosophies, these approaches, and they build and manage libraries, as well as working in whole other settings. And that's where new librarianship is. It starts with the librarian, starts with you and the community, and then from there says, well, what then does a library look like? What kind of services and functions do we build? Focus on librarians and their impact facilitating learning. Um, that is, once again, what is a library, right? In new librarianship, a library is a librarian serving their community. That may look like a beautiful building with glass and steel and books and wood, but it may look like an individual sitting in an office in front of a webcam. It may look like an online database that has no physical presence. And in fact, that becomes very important because when the librarian is serving a community, 
our communities don't necessarily look the same. There was a time not too long ago that when we wanted to sort of bring knowledge to the world and we were going to build libraries in sub-Saharan Africa, we we're going to build libraries in Southeast Asia, we were going to bring libraries in rural North America, what have you, they would all look the same. The idea is, well, if we have the collection strategy right, if we have the services right, we know how to do this, let's put a library in and it will have a positive effect. Now what we realize, because learning is our main goal and learning is individual, we need to have that library look like the community. And what a library looks like in Sub-Saharan Africa or South America, North America, Asia, what have you, is going to be different community by community. If you go back to that first slide with all those different libraries, not only do they physically look different, but they have different philosophies. They are about different communities and the service they put in. That notion of local being the living room of the community is the idea that it's a, you know, that's a construct in the Netherlands. What is a living room? What do we do that? What is it used for? When you look at the Oslo Public Library, once again, the philosophy of what our community needs is X, Y, or Z. As we, uh, I went to two branches also while I was in Oslo. Um, and one was all about light and steel and openness, and one was relatively dark, but it felt like a, a nightclub. In fact, it had two wings, and in each wing it had a stage. And what they would do is they would invite local musicians, authors, actors, etc., to come and, and create and present events. Same system, but two very different libraries. And when you looked at the community, the libraries were saying, you know, we're in a gentrifying area real estate is getting more expensive. So when people get apartments, they tend to be very small. They need a place just to go and sort of have some room and do some work and to hang out. That's what this library looked like. This library is all about literacy or reading. And so it's got kids materials and a huge kids area, what have you. So uh, this new librarianship is based on learning and learning theory. That is, how do people learn and building from that. Once again, if you're in the knowledge business, you're in the conversation business. So what is a librarian? As I said, new librarianship starts with the librarian. Now, what a definition of a librarian isn't necessarily someone with an accredited degree, right? We have um, all of the Netherlands and Belgium, they no longer have formal library science programs at universities. So that doesn't mean they don't have any librarians in the country. We have lots of people um, in rural America that are hired with maybe a bachelor's degree or not even, but they become the library director. And then we have people that do go through formal education processes, learning processes. So we can't necessarily define it by the piece of paper or credential they have. We need a different way of defining what a librarian is. For me, in New Librarianship, there are three primary components that define what a librarian is. The first is their mission. And this is shared whether you have the degree or not, whether you're in Belgium, whether you're in the US, whether you're in Portugal, wherever you are, and that is the mission of librarians is to improve society through facilitating knowledge creation in their communities. So take that as two major parts. The first is to improve society. We want to be a, a good, whether it's a good through university, through once again, a, a locality, through a school, what have you. We want to make that community smarter, make better decisions, and the community members to have meaning in their life to find a reason to be there, to find their dreams and aspirations. So our mission is to make the world better. And in doing that, we're not neutral. We have an idea of what better is, what that means. We'll get to that in a bit. But how do we do that, right? Everyone talks about improving communities. Everyone from the police force to politicians to Google to Microsoft to whomever. What it makes it unique to us, and that is that we're once again helping people build knowledge, helping people learn. Now, once again, that's not unique. There are people in schools and professors and such that would claim that mission as well. So just that mission, while vital and important to connect librarians in Portugal to librarians here in South Carolina to around the world, it's not uniquely defining more libraries. And that's okay, because that kind of mission tells us who our partners are and how to connect and who we should be working with. So, we need at least two other components to uniquely identify the profession, the vocation of librarians. The first are the values. Librarians are a principled profession. That is, we put in effect our values, our principles, and we make it transparent and share it with all. 
those values, those core values that we hold or principles are learning. What we do, we do through a lens of learning. Now, I want to be really clear. That's not saying that all of our libraries need to look like classrooms and have lecture halls and things of that nature. It means that people learn all sorts of things in all sorts of ways. Clearly, in a university context, we're worried about learning as assessed in courses and exams and grades and such. But we're also, particularly in public libraries, interested in people learning about themselves. Finding a great book and understanding why they thought that was a great book. Finding a narrative that gives them a new view on the world. Finding a place to just be with other people like them. That's a learning endeavor. There's been a lot of talk, for example, about how many countries, particularly African nations and communities within it, get flattened. That is, we look at them in a sort of one way. Oh, that's where poverty is, that's where disease is, that's where they need development. And yet, first of all, Africa is not a country, it's, it's a continent. And what's in South Africa, what's in Morocco, what's in Nigeria, what's in all these different areas, they may have very different areas. But they all have teenagers coming of age. They all have children struggling with understanding the world. They have lawyers, they have authors, they have scientists, they have custodians, they have politicians. And we don't see those narratives, and so we begin to flatten our understanding of that world. And so part of learning is reading the fiction of these areas, reading the poetry of these areas, where we're getting a better sense of the community in life. So our value, we value learning. We value openness. That is, that when we do this, we do it in a transparent way. We explain why we're making our decisions. We explain why these may be good resources or bad resources. We make things available to people. We've gotten rid of the closed stacks and opened them up. We value diversity. That is, learning happens, the best learning happens in the richest learning environment, whether that's ethnic diversity, whether that's religious diversity, whether that's social class diversity, whether that's geographic diversity, we value multiple viewpoints coming together, working together. And so we create safe spaces, we'll get to that in a moment, to explore dangerous ideas and work together. We value intellectual freedom and safety. So a library is a safe place to explore dangerous ideas. It's a place where if it's going to be learning, we have to give people a sense of a civil conversation. We have to make them feel physically safe, but we also have to make them feel emotionally safe and intellectually safe. It's a place where different viewpoints don't try and shout each other out. We create a level playing field so that good ideas can emerge, be discussed, understood, and explored. And finally, we believe in intellectual honesty, but that's not the same thing as saying we believe that we are neutral or objective. Libraries exist in a material world. When we decide what hours we're open or are we open on Sundays, that has an effect upon a community. When we decide that our collection budgets are going to buy these books and not these books, that has an effect on a community. When we talk about what we put on the web, when we talk about what services we offer, when we talk about all the decisions that we make on a daily basis, they have an effect. And they're not neutral or objective. Right? We favor certain folks versus other folks. We favor, for example, making sure that everyone has equitable access versus only the people with lots of resources. That's not neutrality. That's not objective. It's a decision. It's a decision that we've thought through that meet our values, that we've thought about it, but it's not the same as being neutral. Librarians are not neutral. Libraries are not neutral. If you feel that you are a social and community good, you have to have a definition of what good is, and it's not neutral. So once again, we have this mission, and we have these values. But still, that's not enough, because what makes a library then, and not a teacher or a publisher? And that's where we need the third thing, and that is how we go about fulfilling our missions, how we go about doing that mission and living out our values. And that's in how we facilitate learning. How do librarians help our communities learn, get smarter, and find meaning? Well, the first thing that we do, and the first thing that people think about with libraries, is the notion of access. We provide access to knowledge, that is other people, 
access to materials, access to a safe space, access to online databases, access to all these sorts of things. A lot of librarianship is focused on access. Even our definition of cataloging is providing intellectual access to resources and materials. But because we're in knowledge and learning, and as we'll see in a moment, that means we're in the business of participation and connecting people, we need to also think about access not only to materials that we may house as the library, as a community, but we also have to think about access to our community and providing the world with access to our folks. Do we host local history? Do we help people generate podcasts that they can share with the world? Do we help mus musicians put together music and poets and writers and what have you? Is it a place that the community can publish its view and its materials and its, mater uh, its understanding to the world? So that's one. But the problem with access is just because you have access doesn't mean that you're going to learn. We'll go back to that example of a book that's written in another language. Right? Just because you have access to it doesn't mean you can read it. So we also have to facilitate learning knowledge. We provide workshops. We provide online tutorials. We provide new interfaces and ways for people to learn. Sometimes it's language instruction. Sometimes it's about the library. Sometimes it's all sorts of things that our community need. But that's still not enough. I have access to, say, this book. I can read this book, but I don't feel safe doing it. And so we begin to talk about privacy. We begin to talk about how libraries ensure that people can come together. That when we host events, we make sure that we are doing it in a way that a community feels it can collaborate and learn, not be threatened. And this is what we're learning again and again, is that much of librarianship has build, been built up around views of safety, but only of the majority. We have people walking in of different colors, of different races, of different nationality to our libraries and not feeling welcome. So we need to be spend a time thinking about what's the environment we create so that people can collaborate and will collaborate together. So once again, I have access to the book. I know how to read the book. I feel safe reading the book. Do I want to read the book? So our last form of facilitation is motivation. How do we motivate people to learn? Whether that's internal motivation, oh, I found the perfect book and I love this book, or external motivation in, say, a university context. My professor says I have to write a paper. Can you suggest a good book? We have to understand what's driving people to learn. And between these three things, our mission, our values, and our means of facilitation, we can uniquely define what a librarian is. And because we can do that, when the librarians go to build their libraries, once again, grand structures of steel and glass, or humble residences, or no libraries at all, no physical spaces at all, or in Kenya, literally a camel with materials that can be unfurled and brought to the most remote sites. All of these things fit together to say that's what a librarian is and that's how they build their communities. So our libraries, the community of libraries may look very different, but the professionals within them can talk across those differences and share common understandings, values, and best practice. So I mentioned before that the core of what we do is about learning. And you need to know a couple of things about how we understand learning because many librarians, once again, through degree, whether it's their job title, they were hired into it, or whether the spirit of a librarian, the three ways of becoming a librarian, you're in the learning business. First, you have to understand that knowledge is constructed, that how I understand the world and how you understand the world, even though we may have the same facts and we may have the same processes, aren't, don't necessarily have the same emphases and relationships. So we construct knowledge, and we do that in this ongoing dialogue between us and a teacher, us and our friends, us and ourselves, us and our governments, what have you. And because it's this conversation, hey, do you understand this? Does this make sense? Does this agree with this? All of this ongoing dialogue about how we understand the world, it's always participatory. You can't have two people in a conversation and only one person participates. The other person has to at least be actively learning and engaging, if not sharing and connecting and trying to make sense of things. And because it's always participatory, and because libraries are about learning, we have to look at the library itself, the, the function that we're building, as participatory, as a place where people get together and share their ideas, share their understanding. I'll show you a few examples of that. 
and learning socially situated. That is, how we understand different factors and facets is influenced by the world we live in, our neighbors, where we work, et cetera. And so we have to be aware of the context of people and how they learn, not simply the fact that they want to. So let me give you some examples of how this really looks in the world rather than these grand abstractions, and then I'll finish up. This is the Tacoma, um, sorry, yes, the Topeka and Shawnee County Public Library in Kansas here in the United States. And they put together a mission plan, a strategic plan, things that we do on a regular basis. But what's amazing about it is when they did it, they did it through this lens of community and learning and understanding. So what you're seeing on the screen is literally their strategic plan, their commitment right, to enhance citizens' lives through services when and where and how they're needed. And then they have specific goals to support economic vitality of our community. Hmm. Notice the difference that when you adopt this focus on a community and the learner and not on the books and materials and stuff, suddenly the impact that we want to have isn't we have a better collection, we have more people coming in the door, it's our community is better. In this case, our community is economically vital. We then can take that into, well, who's not succeeding in this economy and pay attention there. There are others are monitor and respond to social changes with information to help people manage and improve their lives. Support and nourish, I love that word, nourish the community spirit, imagination, and culture, and contribute to the growth and development of our community's families and children. Now, what I love about this is, up to this point, new librarianship in general has pretty, it's pretty abstract, it's pretty high level. This takes it right down to the world of what we're going to do. Now you may say, Dave, a vital community and learning whenever you need isn't exactly specific, but what they have done is they've actually put for each one of those goals specific outcomes, specific areas. And so this chart says things like, all right, the goal is to contribute to the growth and development of our communities, families, and children, which sounds really abstract. Well, we have a project. It's called the Teen Space Evaluation. And here are the actions that need to happen. We need to conduct an evaluation of this and make recommendations for improvement. This is the date we're going to do it by. This is who's responsible for doing it. And here's a status update. When we talk about contributing to the growth and development of our community and of children, we have another project, which is to expand the library's reach in delivering these. And once again, so it starts with the high-level concept. Why are we here? A vital economic community, families and children. And it goes down to very specific things, which is how do we help them learn and understand. And so we're driving a library not by what we do and what we have, but by who we serve and what impact we want to do. This is another example. This comes from the um, Richland Public Library, which is actually here in South Carolina. And they have things like they one of their strategic goals is to advance their community, um, to advance their community, right? The library brings diverse people together to solve community problems. Our work enhances community strengths and increases overall livability. And they mean it. So they put together a service called Critical Conversations. They began, for example, talking about race. And so they brought different people of different ethnicities, different races together, and began talking about what's your life like? How can it be better? How do we understand each other? Not, what do you think of the library? What can the library do? The library was a function helping the community have that conversation. And once again, they brought it down into specific goals, right? To help create a strong and resilient economy, to strengthen community cohesion, to transform educational outcomes for youth, to increase equity, inclusion, and opportunity. And once again, each one of those major goals has specific outcomes, right? So to help a strong and resilient economy, they want to be community leaders, uh, view us, the community leaders view us as vital parts that make our community more livable, uh, attract businesses, they are artists and designers, et cetera. So they're breaking it down, but it starts with, why do we have a library? It's not access to a bunch of stuff, it's a community that's improved and learning better, and then what are the tools necessary to make that happen? Ultimately, and this is where I'll end it, what we're seeing right now is a rapid development in libraries. New buildings are only an example of that. Old buildings with new purposes and increased participation, all of this is a part of it. And 
things are moving relatively quickly. This new law, for example, in, in Finland and Norway that includes democratic conversations is new. Things are happening so fast that sometimes we and the communities we serve have a hard time thinking about a good metaphor, thinking about how they connect together. And so we started with the idea of the library as a literacy hub, as I mentioned before. It was a place to go and love reading and get to know reading and materials and et cetera. That didn't quite match what we were doing with communities and these new approaches, so we started packing, talking about the library as a community hub and a third space or a living room for our community. And once again, that doesn't quite get the sort of energy because the other thing that libraries are doing is not only helping people learn, but take that learning to bring action and power within the community. In other words, you come in and you're really worried about your own reading skills. We teach you to read. We also want you to then become an advocate for reading skills and literacy across the population. How do we empower you to do that? And so the metaphor, and, and I really put this up to the Aarhurst um, Public Library in Denmark, uh, and is the idea that the library is a movement. That movement is something where librarians and community members are working hand in hand to achieve common goals within the community. That means that sometimes that may happen in the library, but oftentimes that's going to happen outside of. The other interesting thing about all those libraries I started out with from Oslo and Utrecht and et cetera, is that they all look at it as, they've all done a different equation in spaces. Former libraries they're moving out of, physical structures, were about 30% public space, about 70% librarian space. Included offices, processing, preservation, cataloging, shelving, all that kind of thing. The new equation they're building these buildings around is flipped. That is, the space for librarians is about 30% of that building, and the rest is for public use, whether it's stacks, materials, meeting rooms, maker spaces, just places to hang out, cafes, et cetera. It's about where the community comes to do its business. And with access to the internet and broadband, librarians are leaving the building to do their work. So I'm going to end on that comment, which is once again, that what we're talking about with new librarianship is libraries as librarians doing their work of improving society through knowledge, doing that, exhibiting their values and through different means of facilitation. And when you take that change in how we see librarians, we begin to change how we see libraries, that as community places for action, for learning, and for advocacy, and ultimately a movement that improves the society that we're part of. So I will pause there, and I will uh, hopefully be able to take some questions. I will tell you right up front that I do not speak Portuguese. Uh, so um, I, as clearly, I'm not doing it that way. So. Uh, if there are any texts or questions or conversations we can have, uh, once again, uh, English, please, I apologize. I know I should learn other languages. So, um, I'm not sure. Runa can join us here, but if there, if you could just go ahead and chat, type in your questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer what I can. So I have a question here. Do you think that a library director can be a person without a degree in librarianship? All right. Good question. I think that what makes a librarian, once again, are um, there are three ways to become a librarian. The first is through a degree process that teaches you the fundamentals and primarily the philosophy and understanding, not just the skills. The second is you're hired as a librarian. We have a lot of places that do that. Um, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. 
And the third is what I call librarians by spirit, people who don't actually call themselves librarians but are usually working in partner organizations and share our common beliefs and values and can help us learn. That said, um, and also being really clear that I'm a professor in a library science program that works on getting degreed librarians, I think that that is the bestest, best, best, fastest way of becoming a librarian. I have examples, and they're really good examples, of some fantastic libraries directors that do not have the credential. But what needs to happen is they come with, either they, they learn it, they've been taught it, they develop it, the philosophy of librarianship. And I worry that we don't value that credential enough. And that we often look at that credential as either just a piece of paper or it's out of date and too theoretical. Library science education has to make sure that we are producing relevant courses in education. So we are very much uh, a part of this conversation. But I think that, that library direct there, yes, I think library directors can be hired without credentials so long as the hiring process and the individual hired really does exhibit a true understanding of the philosophy. Why the director? The director's job, uh, most, most successful directors spend very little time in the library. They spend very little time on the functions of the library, and they spend a lot of time about connecting to the community, finding resources, finding partners, uh, advocating for those communities and the libraries within them, and sometimes those skills aren't taught in library school. So it really comes down to this idea of finding the right person, but it has to be someone who shares our values and um, learns and engages in those values. Um, I see another question here. Can, um, sorry, I'm scrolling for a moment. Can I give you advice? Oh, it's still going. Can I give advice um, to become agents of change in our communities? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, a couple of pieces of advice. The first is everyone's learning. There is a downside to be a lifelong, lifelong continuous learner. We don't talk about the cost of being a continuous change agent, someone who lives and tries to always engage. That cost is very much about the fact that that means that yesterday, before we learned this, we were slightly wrong, or sometimes we were very wrong. And we have to sort of forgive ourselves for doing that. That's a tough thing for individuals to learn. What that, the reason I bring that up is when you're working with people who are very reticent to change, people who don't want to change, people who have been doing the same thing for 20 years and don't want to do something else for 21 years, oftentimes they are, you know, they don't want to be vulnerable. They don't want to find out what they did for 20 years but didn't have value. And so you have to approach it from the idea of what is it that they were seeking to do that started them down this road? And let them know that if you hadn't been doing that for 20 years, we couldn't be doing this for the next 20 years. You also have to connect into relatively traditional ideas of librarianship to move them forward. One of the phrases I often use is that the community is your collection. And the idea there is for people who may be very interested in cataloging, classification, shelving, collection development, you could take a lot of those skills and apply them to community expertise and how we share it through programming and is it valued, Does it? how do we organize it, how do, do we describe it. That gives people a bridge. The last thing I would say from being a change agent is, um, this comes from a lot of old research, uh, but a fellow by the name of Lewin talks about change and he says you need uh, three things. The first thing you need to do is unfreeze people. In other words, we live in our regular patterns. I get up in the morning, I commute to work, I have this lunch, I go back. We assume that the car is going to work or that mass transit is available. We assume that we're still employed. There's a pattern to our lives. The first thing you have to do is unfreeze them. You have to say, You've got to, we need to change. And there's two ways to do that. The first is a grand vision. If we change, life will be better. But you also have to give them a little bit of a stick. If we don't change, here's the negative. I don't want that to be overwhelmed, but it's got to be there. Once people are unfrozen, you begin to say, all right, here's the change we're going to do. Here's the new process, the new technique, the new philosophy, the new outlook, the new building. And then the last thing that we often forget is you need to refreeze those people back. That is, if you say, well, we're changing and we're going to be community oriented and we're going to do reference instead of behind the desk, we're going to do it out in the community. It's great. How am I going to be judged on whether I'm a good reference librarian? Are the criteria any different than they used to be? 
What's my job description look like? Who am I reporting to? All of those things that we see as details are vital and important to getting people back in a place of being productive. So just a few suggestions on that. Um, sorry, just catching up here. Um, what are uh, what about new technologies? We're seeing more and more ebooks <laughs> uh, and e-reading. People are online more and more. How do we bring community to our learning center since many of the libraries have obsolete technological materials? Yes, and so the answer is the librarians can't be obsolete technical materials, meaning that we as the professionals need to constantly be experimenting and trying, and vitally important, experimenting and trying and playing with new technologies, new web services, new whatever, in public. We demonstrate that we are learners, and we also demonstrate that being a learner, we're potentially vulnerable. We're trying to understand this right next to our communities. A lot of times when we look at technology, we buy the new widget. I'm going to pretend for a moment this is a new widget. It's a lovely thing. And we grab it and we take it as far away from public eyes and usually our supervisor's eyes. And we try and learn everything about it so we're the experts. And then we present it to the community done. Well, the community just missed an entire opportunity to learn about this along with you. You just learn, you just missed the opportunity to gain trust within the community. And so we need to be learning out loud and we need to be learning in public. That turns into a series of trust. It also turns into the understanding that you need more resources to bring technology up to date and materials around technology up to date. And we need to spend a lot of time bringing those in from different areas as well. Um, also, we realize that a lot of how we look and build up things around technology are policies. Look at policies about what it means to be in, a, in the physical space and what it means to be online. Usually policies about the physical space are be civil, understand other people are around you, um, be kind, share materials, don't be too loud, or join conversations, what have you. It's all about how do we interact with other people. When you look at our policies online, it's almost always don't steal, don't be a pirate, um, don't break this. It's always sort of focused at the individuals. We need those policies to merge together. Um, I like the idea of movement and the idea of conversation, both very important concepts. Uh, would you agree that listening should be there too? You can't have a conversation without listening. Then it's a monologue, it's not a dialogue. Absolutely. Um, a lot of times what we do, and I admit this myself, is we listen to respond. That means we're listening to what you're saying just so we can find some relevant story, fact, idea, or comment to give back to you, as opposed to listening to see what they're doing. And so the idea of we need to learn to listen. But we also need to spend a lot of time developing our personal skills because new librarianship really takes the librarian, the individual, and puts them right in front of the public mission. We no longer hide behind our stacks, behind our desks, behind our policy statements. We're out there having these dialogues on a regular basis. So we need to feel comfortable interacting with the community. Also, a line for supervision and management you have to be give trust and power to your librarians being out in the community so they can make decisions, form partnerships quickly and fluidly, and not feel like they have to go through a 12-year-long process to get the memo of understanding written. So it's important that we practice what we preach. Uh, hi, David. Hi. I like the idea of libraries as places empowering community through advocacy, democratic discussion, et cetera. Um, but specifically on smaller towns, that's not expected. I guess advice on how to start doing that. First, promoting talks and workshops in different subject areas that affect the community where to go. It's interesting when you talk about these, and once again, they're very broad. I mean, it's 45 minutes. Uh, there are more specifics in, that we can get into. Um, a lot of people say, oh, that's great for big cities. That's great for big libraries. That's great for big communities. But I'm a small rural library, what have you actually easier and better to do it from a small library perspective. You can get to know people. You have an understanding. The days when librarians needed to sort of be anonymous and never understand the individual and sort of never build these relationships is old thinking. Librarianship used to be about transactions. How many books were borrowed? How many people came in the building? How many reference questions were answered? How long did it take? Now it's about relationship building. How connected am I to the community? How aware am I of community conversations and effort? How welcome am I out in the community? And in small libraries, 
small towns, small universities, you actually have a better way of learning and knowing your community. They're your neighbors. You know them on a regular basis. So one is not necessarily worried about the programming you offer so much as creating a space where people have a conversation. If there are five people in your library, do you go behind the desk, sit down, and go, so how's your day going? What are you working on? What are you thinking about? Do you have, and I understand this is a resource question, but do you have the ability to get out of the building, to go to town hall and town conversations? We, we tend to think about these conversations, these gatherings as places we do in a library. And yet a lot of it, back to the sort of switching of how much space is devoted to librarians versus the public, is going to where the, the conversation is. Where is that conversation occurring? Is it occurring in an arts council, in a town hall? How are we there? And we don't show up to the town hall or the arts council and say, what do you think about the library? It's all about the library. We sit there and say, what are you working on? What are you thinking about? Did you know that this person was working on that? Did you know that this initiative and funding is available to you? All of those things. That's how we're going to create this community conversation. And we're going to need to do it in large cities, and we're going to need to do it uh, in small cities, and we're going to need to do it online. I mean, we have to spend a little bit of time looking at what Twitter is like, and does it create a welcoming atmosphere of learning, or is it an area that, frankly, is of accusation and confrontation? How can we create those environments within our libraries, but also online and within the cities? So if you can do it, get out of your library. Let the, let the community do what they need in the library, get out of the library, get to where people are learning and doing and understanding. I see that we're, we're pretty much out on time, uh, so our time is up. I'm going to go ahead, and if there are additional questions or conversations that you'd like to have, uh, I'm typing my email into, uh, into this dialogue, so feel free to reach out and connect to me. Uh, I believe the recording will be made available to others. And I am always interested in doing whatever I can to talk to you know, your key stakeholders, your staff, libraries. You know, I'm only a video away, and I'll figure out the time zones. Um, but I really appreciate your time today. Thank you all very much. Have a great day.